Hello everyone, welcome back to episode 87. Thank you very much for joining me and a very happy new year to you all. We are in 2024, which I am thrilled about because I do love an even number. Don't know about you, but I'm a bit OCD about that. Love an even number year. So I hope that you all enjoyed celebrating. I spent it with some family and friends having a little do at my mum and dad's house, so that was nice. But I did switch from Prosecco to fizzy water by about 10 o'clock because I wasn't feeling very well. And I wasn't feeling very well because I got a bit cocky with my new Ninja air fryer that I got for Christmas. And I decided to bake a loaf and it was a bad, bad decision. Now, for those of you that don't know, I am rather renowned for my lack of skills in the kitchen, particularly when it comes to baking. And I have had a number of baking disasters over the years, which I have never yet lived down. Um, So it wasn't a good idea. In fact, shall shall we do a story time? And I'll share a couple of them with you. I know that a good chunk of you are just here for the Bolton accent and the humorous disasters. So why the fuck not? Um, Where shall I start? Oh, I've got a good one to start off with. So I once attempted (laughs) to make a rice pudding pie for my poor ex-boyfriend, Kieran. And I know what you're thinking, but it did seem like a really good idea at the time. He loved rice pudding, he loved pies, and I was very eager to please at that time in my life. (laughs) So I thought, do you know what? I'm making a fucking rice pudding pie, he'll be thrilled. And the idea was... (laughs) Oh, God, I'm laughing thinking back to how horrendous it must have been. But the idea of it was <laughs> a pastry crust with a, layer, <laughs> with a layer of jam and then a layer of rice pudding over the top. <laughs> and I told my mum, who's really good about uh, baking, um, about my idea. And she told me, after trying to strongly discourage me, as she always does, from even attempting any kind of baking, that if I insisted that I was doing it, I would need to <laughs> I would need to blind bake the pastry. <laughs> and she has all these like fancy baking things because she's really into it. Um and she uses these things called baking beans that are like little clay things and you put them in. But she said cuz I didn't have any of them, I could use some lentils and like dry split peas, you know, like shit that you've got in the cupboard that you'd never use. So, like, she said I could use those to weigh it down, and I did. But what I didn't realise was (laughs) that you have to put greaseproof paper (laughs) between the pastry and the peas and the lentils. (laughs) And she told me later on that she didn't think that she'd have to specify that because she told me it was obvious, but no, it was not obvious to me. So, as you can imagine, I was so enthusiastic and I, I did all my pastry... And then I put the, <laughs> the lentils and the split peas over the top and they just came out like 20 minutes later, just deeply baked into it, hundreds of the little lentil fuckers. And I tried to pick them all out individually, but I just couldn't be asked. So after the first 10, I thought, oh, it'll be right because I've always had a positive outlook on life. And I just smothered it in a, <laughs> in a thick layer of jam. <laughs> And then poured rice pudding over the top of it and let it set and then served it up. And it was the heaviest baked good I have ever felt in my life. The weight of it was incredible. And I still remember the look of absolute horror and sympathy on his face when I presented <laughs> presented him with it. And bless him, he did try and eat it. And the whole pie was just so utterly disgusting that he didn't even notice that it had baked in lentils because they were truly the least of his worries. Um, Another time I made a carrot cake. Now, this was going really well at first and I was fucking amazed because, you know, I I had this reputation by then. Um, So we were all, like, quite shocked at how well it looked and I took it out of the oven, it had risen, it was a perfect golden brown colour, I love carrot cake, it smelled absolutely delightful. So I spent ages, like, carefully icing it and full of pride, showing off, like, Murray Berry. And then I, I cut a slice of it and looked inside to find that it was completely 
hollow. <laughs> nothing in the middle. It was like the fucking Millennium Dome. Like, absolutely nothing in the middle. And I have no idea how that happened because it was quite impressive. Quite an impressive feat, I think. And we're all amazed that I could pull off such a stunt. But I don't know how I did it and I never made another carrot cake. And then the final one, which is probably the worst of all. And then I will move on. Um, I say finally because there are many, many more, but God loves a trier. So there was the time when I made cupcakes, again, unsupervised by an adult. I was an adult, but I needed a a more adulty adult to supervise me. And I thought I'll make them as a nice surprise for my mum and dad when they get back. I think they've been away somewhere. And uh, they were more than surprised (laughs) when they reluctantly bit into one of them and said that they tasted like pork. (laughs) so i was like so confused i tasted like pork as was everybody else and after a bit of quizzing and investigation we got to the bottom of it and it turns out that lard is not a suitable alternative to butter when you're making strawberry buttercream (laughs) and i was not aware of this i just assumed that lard was like margarine turns out it's like pork fat anyway So the reason I was talking about that was because despite my past failures, I never learned clearly and I decided to bake a loaf in my ninja. (laughs) And uh, I showed off about it a lot, actually. I distributed sections of the loaf to my family members, wrapped it in tinfoil. I was very proud. Smug, even, I'd say. I posted about the loaf all day on my stories and I tucked into it ignoring the unbaked doughy thread that was clearly running through the centre. And like always, I just spread some jam on it and thought, fuck it, it'll be reet. Well, let me tell you, it was not reet. It was not reet at all. By tea time, it was like a fucking scene from The Exorcist in my house. I spent the whole night just violently Catherine wheeling on the bathroom floor. (laughs) trying to miss the cat's fur who'd inconveniently decided to accompany me into the bathroom and if you don't know what Catherine Wheeler is then I don't advise that you look it up it's not good but it was a scene similar to the one where Augustus Gloop falls in the chocolate river but with added vomit so lesson learned on the plus side it was a very very effective way of shedding some of those Christmas pounds so you win some you lose some so, shall we start? I've been talking for seven minutes. <laughs> I've not even started. You've just had a rundown of my horrific baking history. So, I was just going to wish you a Happy New Year, but I got a bit carried away. So, because it's New Year, and although real New Year is in the middle of March, as far as I'm concerned, because that's when we as humans are naturally ready to wake up from our winter slumber and start creating, and the world starts to come back to life. We see lots of things being born and lots of growth. January is collectively seen as the official new beginning of the year and that is where most people feel like they need to get going and they need to be productive and make moves towards the goal. So today I want to help you to do that with the caveat of telling you that if you don't feel like you are yet ready to do that that's okay it's no problem you can crawl back in your cave for another few months it's all right babe. So you can shift this forward to any point but particularly the middle of March, which is the real um, New Year if we're looking at the, the proper seasons. So we'll probably do a podcast on that near the timer. So if you're anything like me, maybe you feel like you struggle with procrastination and you always feel like you're not sure what to do next because it feels a bit overwhelming. And especially if you've got really big goals like a lot of us have. I have always been a no or a not no kind of gal historically and it it works I do get shit done but it's always at the very last minute and that can be a bit stressful and although I do love and accept myself exactly as I am it is something that I am working on improving through digging up that limiting belief that I hold about myself that I am a bit flaky and that I'm a procrastinator that is driving that kind of behavior and planting the new seeds that are going to serve me better so a part of that is actually incorporating shock horror a bit of planning a bit of a planning system so that you spend less time faffing around and being a busy fool which I am I've been very good at in the past and spend more time taking intentional actions that are 
aligned with your goals and are going to move you forward in the right direction. And in turn, you have more time to just have fun and live your life. And that is something that I really advocate, despite the fact that I'm often not very good at it, but I'm improving. But it is something that I think is really important because if you are anything like me, you can spend easily all day or all week just fucking about doing stuff and feeling busy and burnt out and tired and feeling like you're not making the progress that you'd hoped. And all it is is simply a lack of a clear vision and clear direction and knowing where to focus your attention and your energy and and where to use your time effectively. And I really feel like everyone's life would benefit from that and be so much more enjoyable if we work smarter and not harder. Like there's almost a bit of a culture that you have to be just hustling all the time to be successful. And that isn't the case. You don't have to be like that. And lots of successful people, and I say success in whatever that means to you, are not working like that. They're, they're, working, hard, uh, they're working smarter, not harder. So uh, for an example, in school every week, I have a class in year three and I happen to be there while they're doing the spelling. So I teach the spelling group and they have to be tested weekly in school. So I do a test with them um, on the ones that they had from last week. And we always celebrate the progress from the week before. I never, you know, praise them on how high the score is. It's always about if they've improved the score, because I think that's important too. And then I'll give them the new ones, we'll look at them together and I'll teach them the new spelling rule uh, that we'll learn about that week. And then before they go, I read out the new words to them and I ask them to write them on a whiteboard with no pressure. That's why they're on a whiteboard, because kids just feel less pressure when they're working on whiteboards for some reason. I suppose it's because it's not permanent. Uh, No one sees the score. I don't see the score. Nobody asks for it. It's just for them. And then when they're taking the new spelling list, I tell them to put a little star on any of the ones that they got wrong. And I always remind them that they've only just got the words and that I'd be very impressed if they could spell any of them at all. And generally, they usually get, well, they get 10 spellings and they usually get about seven right on average on the first attempt because we've just taught the spelling rule. And then I'll tell them to practice the other three in the week and then tell the grown-ups that Miss Wads said they can spend the rest of the time having fun and playing that they would have been practising the spellings. And they love it because the scores are good, they get better, they feel confident, and most of all, they don't feel like they've spent all week writing the same words over and over again that they already know how to spell because what's the fucking point? Like, No kid wants to practise the spellings that they can already spell. And it's the same for us. If we know what we need to work on and what's going to move us forward, it's like those three words in a spelling test. It's given us clarity on where to spend our time and where to spend our focus and allows us the rest of the time for just enjoying our life instead of doing unnecessary work that's not really being effective in any way. So what I've started doing recently, very recently, only in the last like month or two, And what I think would be really helpful for you as well this year is to look at the year ahead in quarters. So if you are starting from January, then quarter one will be January, February, March. So it's three month quarters. And I'm finding that it's a really good amount of time to break down your big yearly goals into smaller chunks because a year is way too far away for me. Like It's way too long an amount of time. A month is too short and a week is way too short for me, at least. But a quarter is roughly 90 days and I'm finding that it's close enough to be able to see the end point and it not feel like it's another lifetime away, but it's also long enough for um, allowing setbacks here and there and things not going quite to plan that if you uh, were having weekly goals or monthly goals might have more of a negative impact on your progress. So I think having that wiggle room to have a bit of a shitty week or not a shitty week, but, you know, where you don't quite get to doing something, maybe you're ill, maybe something happens and still be able to pull yourself back on track and make that same progress in that amount of time is really motivating, in my opinion. And it's kind of like that uh, quote by... Is it Bill Gates? I think it's Bill Gates that says most people overestimate what they can do in a year and underestimate what they can do in 10 years. So obviously that's on a bigger scale, but on a smaller scale, we could change it to saying that most people overestimate what they can do in a week, but underestimate what they can do in 90 days. So 
when you are planning for your year ahead, just focus on this first quarter. And like I said before, that quarter doesn't have to start yet. If you want to get back in that cave and hibernate for a bit, that's fine. But if you are starting now, look at January, February, March. And I haven't talked about planning out quarter two, quarter three and quarter four at this point. And there's a reason for that. And it's because the progress that you make in this first quarter is going to change. It's going to change your goals. It's going to change the way you think. You're going to grow. Your consciousness is going to expand. So you might end up reaching quarter two and realise that you've already achieved what you wanted to, uh, you know, what you had planned for quarter two, or even that your goals have changed. And what you planned at the start of the year just feels like out of alignment. It could be like a project that you were planning and now you don't feel like that's the right thing. And then you would have to replan it all, which is time that you could have spent having fun and enjoying your life instead. So another good reason to only plan a quarter at a time is that it will force you to go back to your goals instead of yearly. You'll be going back to them after each 90 day period to review where you're up to and also to plan where you're going in your next quarter, which is giving you that new sense of drive and enthusiasm that we usually only get at a new year. If you were to ask yourself, honestly, did you write New Year's goals down last year and achieve them? Then the answer would probably be no, at least to most of them, if you set them as yearly goals and nothing else. And I can tell you that I didn't achieve a lot of my goals for this year. And that was partly, well, mostly because I was using a system that was not working well for me. It was too far away for me to take action on them. So by using this system, it's like you're having four mini new years and four opportunities to review your progress, four opportunities to get really excited about the next part and giving yourself enough time to make some real significant progress without... um, you know, feeling like the schedule's so tight that you can't have a day off or you can't cock something up or you can't, you know, be ill for a few days or whatever happens during life because it does happen. So I'm really enjoying this new 90-day strategy and I would encourage you to really focus on what aligned actions you want to take in that 90-day space of time rather than the span of the whole year. Having said that, There is an even shorter term system that fits into that really well um, and kind of runs very well alongside it. And it's super impactful for me, at least. And it's making me work much smarter and less hard, which is woo. we love that. We love that for us. And this is an idea that I heard from a very well-known man called Bob Proctor, who was an incredible teacher of all things manifestation. And it's called the 25K idea. And I think it was um, originally done by Earl Nightingale. If you go to a website called www.nightingale.com, it's called the $25,000 idea article by Earl Nightingale because it is quite long. It's not like super long, but probably bore you to death if I read the whole thing. So I'm just going to condense it to tell you what the action is in case you just want to do that. But in a nutshell, there was a president of a company that did steel work, right? And they asked the advice of this man called Ivy Lee. Or was it Lee Ivy? No, Ivy Lee. And... He basically said that he was busy, but he didn't know how to improve his business and to get the business to make more money. And this person, Ivy Lee, then told him that he could give him this idea in 20 minutes that would increase his business efficiency by at least 50%. And the president was like quite taken aback by this because he said he had all the knowledge and the people who worked for him had all the knowledge but things weren't getting done as efficiently as he would like. So Ivy Lee gave him a piece of paper and he told him to fold it in half and fold it in half again. How many pieces is that? That's four. Fold it in half again. And then basically just write six things that needed to be done to move the business forward. They didn't have to be massive things. 
they just had to be like intentional actions basically like the most important things that needed to get done because if you are a bit of a procrastinator like me I'm going off track but I'm going to come back on I promise you like I remember being at school and having tons of marking it was stressing me out so much that I couldn't relax but you would find me sharpening pencils and colour coordinating them so I was busy and I was staying late and I was doing random shit but I was avoiding what needed to be done and if I'd have just spent that same time doing the marking then I would have had that sense of peace and also I would have been moving further forward so he asked him to write these things that needed doing on and then the second step is to order them in order of importance from one to six so he's got his six things that need doing the next day that are going to move his business forward he's ordered them in um order of most important to least important and then he told him to just take that piece of paper out in the morning and work through them from number one to number six and if you don't get up to number six that's all right move it on to the next day as number one and do that every day. Now, I tried this. Um, I'm still trying it. I haven't done it over Christmas, but I was trying it before Christmas and fuck me. I was getting shit done and it wasn't just any shit. It was shit that was moving me forward. It was good shit. So I would really recommend you try doing that because I know it sounds like nothing but this president of this steel company was so impressed by the way that that simple idea moved his business forward and uh, improved his efficiency of everybody working there that he actually sent Ivy Lee a check for $25,000 and it was such a simple idea but he felt that it was worth that amount of money so it's called the $25,000 idea so try it because it's amazing and those little steps a lot of what Ivy Lee was talking about before and you'll see it if you read the article is that it's a bit like laying bricks so you've got your foundations and then every single day you're laying little bricks so every time you complete one of those little activities off your list of things to do you've laid a brick and you've laid it well you've finished it completely you've not skipped onto the next bit and you've not like missed one out You've done it in the order that it needs to be done from the bottom up. And by the end of it, you've got a house or a building or whatever it is. And that is really the message, isn't it? Like there's no, there is no quick way to success in any way that you look at success, whether it's financial success or health success or anything at all. It is literally brick by brick. It's putting in those little repetitions of small actions that are going to move you forward And keeping a close eye on it and reviewing it every 90 days is going to make a massive impact on where you are now to where you are at the end of 2024. And I want to have a really good, really amazing 2024 full of goals ticked off my list and not just ticked off my list. I want to enjoy my year as well. I don't just want to be, oh, I've done that, I've done that, I've done that. I want to actually feel like I have time and mental space to make, oh, Gloria's just bit my foot. She doesn't like that idea. Um, but I have time and space to enjoy it as well, not just be hustling all the time. And when I tried that little uh, $25,000 idea trick, I'd done all of the tasks that would have normally taken me a week. I'm not joking you like a week because I would have been faffing about for ages because I woke up already knowing what I was doing the day after. I sat down and I just got straight to work and I'd done it within like two hours and the rest of the day was for me. And what a way to live. So, yeah, I hope you found this episode useful. I feel like I've gone off on a few tangents, though. We've talked about the Great British Bake Off of my life and various other topics, but I hope that that's been useful for you as a New Year's episode and I will be talking a bit more about New Year in the real New Year in March. But I hope that you have a wonderful week and Happy New Year and I will speak to you all soon. See you later.